Good morning. Welcome to the forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Michelle Williams, Dean of the Faculty here at the school, and I'm delighted to see you all here today. I'm also delighted to welcome our online viewers around the world, including those tuning in from India, Hong Kong, and other sites globally, as well as those in our community who are spread across the campuses in Boston and in Cambridge. Today we are gathered to discuss an essential concept that at times may feel elusive, and that concept is well-being. I'm deeply honored and really humbled to welcome our distinguished guest, Dr. Deepak Chopra, New York Times best-selling author and founder of the Chopra Foundation. Dr. Chopra is a world-renowned expert on well-being. He has recently published a new book, The Healing Self, a revolutionary new plan to supercharge your immunity and stay well for life. This is a book that's co-authored with Harvard's own neurology professor, Dr. Rudy Tanzi. This event this morning is presented jointly with PRI's The World and WGBH, and I am pleased to welcome the world's Carol Hills, our moderator for today's conversation with Dr. Chopra. We are streaming live on the websites of the world and the forum, as well as other social media platforms. We will look at our world today as we tend to focus on the problems that many of us confront here at the school and beyond. For example, think about the problems we confront, chronic and infectious diseases undermining the health of populations. Natural disasters strike, often hitting hardest the most vulnerable populations. Social injustices and health disparities sadden and frustrate us all. And mental health, a key part of overall wellness tends to go underappreciated or even unappreciated in some contexts. Yet psychosocial stress, depression, and anxiety impact hundreds of millions of people around the world. So what can public health do about these challenges? How can public health help? Let me offer a few examples to illustrate how public health can help. We can recognize that healthy lives across the life course are not just those lived without sickness and disability. We can help people engage in wellness across their life spans. What do we mean by that? We can help people by easing access to affordable and nutritious food. We can help by promoting social connectedness. We can help by offering access to good quality health care. And we can help by educating people about the importance of managing stress and getting enough sleep and exercise. We can also encourage a holistic approach that supports these foundations with respect to personal health as well as within healthy communities. And perhaps most importantly, we can help to bring evidence that drives policy to promote systems and approaches that bolster the well-being of entire populations. We here at the Harvard Chan School consider well-being as such an important part of what constitutes a healthy world that we have identified well-being and nutrition as key components of our research mission. We will begin today with Dr. Chopra giving brief remarks here at the podium, and then he will join Carol Hills in a conversation. We have already received a large number of questions in advance of our session, and Carol will share some of those with you, along with questions contributed by our, our local viewing audience here. To start today's program, I get to do an Oprah. I'm sure she'd like to know that her name's a verb as well. I have 
an opportunity to have a little fun. And what I'd like to do is ask everyone here in the auditorium to look at the postcards at the desk in front of them. And if your postcard has a sticker on the reverse side, then I'm happy to share with you that you will receive a complimentary copy of The Healing Self after our program. So read it, enjoy it, be well, have fun. It is now my great pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Chopra to the podium. Well, thank you, Dr. Williams, uh, Dean Williams, and thank you all for being here. I'm very honored, privileged, and always happy to come back to Boston. Uh, my training was here in internal medicine, endocrinology, and then neuroendocrinology. So I was telling um, Dean Williams that my career has spanned uh, internal medicine, endocrinology, discovery of neuropeptides as molecules of emotion, getting into mind-body medicine, integrative health and well-being, and today addressing the heart problem of consciousness. So. I'd like to start off by saying that as biological organisms, we are already a holistic process. All biological organisms function holistically. A human body has uh, more than 60 trillion cells, which is more than all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. A human body can think thoughts, play a piano, kill germs, remove toxins, make a baby, all at the same time while monitoring the movement of planets and stars as its own biological rhythms, circadian rhythms, seasonal rhythms, gravitational rhythms, even lunar rhythms. That homeostasis or self-regulation is a natural state. And the extreme end of the spectrum, if homeostasis or self-regulation, which is a dynamic, process of non-change within change is one extreme, then low-grade chronic inflammation is the other extreme, which um, leads to disease. Only 5%, only 5% of disease-related gene mutations are fully penetrant, which means they cannot be stopped. 5%. If somebody has a BRCA gene, for example, for breast cancer, that's a fully penetrant gene. And one needs to do remedial measures as prevention. Angelina Jolie has gone public with her preventive mastectomy and so forth because she had that gene. Now, what most people don't know, other than those who are really involved, is that's true of 95% of chronic illness in our world. Even mutations that lead to disease are not fully penetrant. So if you have, say, 30 identified genes for Alzheimer's, only three are fully penetrant. Uh, hundreds of genes are involved in various types of cancer. Less than 5% are fully penetrant. And the fact that uh, the risk factors for heart disease, stroke, inflammation, cancer, autoimmune illness, infectious diseases are actually common. They're the same risk factors that uh, we've been looking at for cardiovascular disease for the last 35 years. So with that understanding of our body as a holistic process, a body as a verb, and I'd like to say that Nouns are conventions of language, but they do not reflect reality. Reality is always an activity. Your body is an activity. Even this is an activity at the level of atoms and particles. But biological organisms are so dynamic in maintaining self-regulation that if we put attention to just a few things, and the new sciences of neuroplasticity, Epigen neuroplasticity means that your conscious choices regulate your neural networks, and if you make something a habit, you create something called long-term potentiation of neural networks that 
basically helps you regulate your own biology. And so neural feedback, cardiac feedback, but just simple things like meditation will change the way you look at self-regulation and healing. The word healing comes from the word holy. Healing, holy, wholeness, health are the same word. It's reminding yourself of your connection to wholeness. So with what we know of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, which means we, every experience that you have, every experience, including the experience you're having right now, even if you're online and watching it from India, every experience is modulating not only your neural networks, but your gene activity. And uh, similarly, your microbiome, which is two million extra genes, is responding to every experience you have, whether it's sleep or food or exercise or meditation or yoga. So over the years, I've identified what I call the six pillars of well-being. <clears throat> These are, and not necessarily in uh, order of importance, uh, they're all equally important. So the first is sleep. Uh, we can go into details at any time on that. Second is stress management, mindfulness, meditation, and many other uh, contemplative techniques that have been part of wisdom traditions all over the world. And we have now original research to show that even a week of practice of mindfulness and meditation will upregulate your gene activity. Some genes will go up 17-fold, genes for wound healing, genes for homeostasis, and genes that are responsible for inappropriate inflammation will go down. We have shown that telomerase, the enzyme that regulates your genetic clock, uh, in some cases will go up by 40% in people who practice contemplative self-inquiry, mindfulness, and meditation. There's no drug that will do that. So that's the second pillar. The third is movement. And if you add to that, practices like yoga and breathing pranayam practices, you can specifically target several different organs in your body because yoga has the knowledge of which visceral nerves are activated with which kind of movement, yoga postures or asanas as they're called. So movement is the third pillar. The fourth pillar is emotions. So we know the stress and uh, anger and hostility and uh, guilt and shame and depression all uh, aggravate inflammation and raise blood pressure and, and cause sticky platelets and everything that goes wrong when homeostasis is disrupted. But we now also have evidence that love, compassion, joy, equanimity, a peaceful mind, and even keeping a gratitude list will decrease inflammatory markers and activate the genes that are responsible for homeostasis and self-regulation. So emotions become very practical as a way to harness emotional and social intelligence uh, for optimal self-regulation. And finally, two more things, uh, which one is nutrition, uh, Michelle mentioned. When I was training in internal medicine, people called me and said, you know, I changed my diet and my arthritis went away or my asthma went away. I didn't believe them. I had no basis to understand how that happened. But now that we know that the microbiome, two million genes in your gut, the first thing they see is food. And if your food is contaminated, uh, it's too much fat, too much sugar, too many chemicals or pesticides or petroleum products or processed food, then you have dysbiosis, inflamed microbiome that causes inflammation in the body. Your microbiome, your genes, and your epigenetic mechanisms are all influences the metabolic activity in your body right now. So nutrition becomes very important. And then uh, Carol was asking me, I think, earlier, do I experience jet lag because I travel so much? And I think this is a very important point, that our biological rhythms are very important in self-regulation. And so that uh, we now know that if you eat within the eight hours of daylight, if you get good sleep at night, and if you ground yourself, even by touching a tree 
or walking barefoot on the earth or on grass or by the, on the beach or even using a grounding device that will decrease inflammation in your body. Uh, avoid uh, disruption of circadian rhythms, uh, which uh, is what jet lag is all about. So with these six pillars that I mentioned, you can hone in on your biological sustainability. But if you want to go beyond that, to what essentially is the mission of the School of Public Health, then you have to address bigger problems. There is no social well-being or community well-being in the absence of personal well-being because we are units of society. So if you want to move in the direction of some of the things that um, um, were mentioned by uh, Dr. Williams, uh, if you want to move in the direction of a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world, then we have to look at what creates for purpose-driven well-being or what we call career well-being. Uh, people who have happy careers, who are on purpose, who are engaged with other people who complement their strengths, who have shared vision and are emotionally bonded, create for extremely successful careers. Then you have social and uh, emotional and uh, community well-being, which is uh, do you have a close uh, group of family and friends that you can rely on? Are you socially engaged? Uh, as far as communities are concerned, do you offer some service uh, as a volunteer? Do you gather in a community to envision the future of your community? Do you have some kind of practice, spiritual practice that you do together? In India, and I know people are watching in India, we use these three words, seva, satsang, and simran. Seva means service. Satsang, satsang means a gathering of people who are looking for ways to improve well-being and search for what is called reality. And Simran is some kind of contemplative self-inquiry. Those are the essence of community well-being. Social well-being, career well-being, community well-being, and ultimately financial well-being are linked. Financial well-being doesn't have to do with how much money you make, but uh, the security that you have if you have default uh, ways of ensuring that uh, you will be fine if you fall sick, that you have employment, that you have disability, that you have insurance, and that you can look forward to uh, security as you get old. And finally, the spiritual well-being, which is another topic. Uh, who are we? The hard problem of consciousness. Is consciousness a byproduct of our brain, or is it more fundamental in nature? Is consciousness the source of all experience? And that's what I'm focusing my work on now, uh, totally, uh, looking at the hard problem of consciousness and understanding our consciousness, both personal and collective, as a source of insight, intuition, imagination, creativity, vision, higher purpose, and the power of intention. So when we look at well-being, and it's measurable, everything I've said is measurable. Social well-being, uh, community well-being, financial well-being, physical well-being, emotional well-being. In fact, now, in addition to doing perceived stress scores, we're also doing spiritual well-being stress scores uh, called um, understanding your relationship with uh, the ecosystem at large, not just the social ecosystem, but our connection to nature and ultimately our connection to the universe. It's a big topic. Uh, public health should be the number one discipline for anyone wanting to go into uh, the future of well-being uh, because it's going to be predictable, it's going to be precise, it's going to be preventable in many cases. It's um, going to be participatory, and it's going to be process-oriented. And it's going to require more than academic institutions. It's going to require a global public awareness and require a global action plan um, 
which I think is feasible through uh, blockchain technologies and other social networks so that we can collectively not only envision but practically embark in the direction of a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world. I was sharing with Michelle some of our research now at the Chopra Foundation uh, through meta-analysis of big data. It seems the number one epidemic in, of our civilization is stress, but it's also connected directly or indirectly to almost every illness that you can think of, and even to social violence and conflict, and ultimately even climate change can, change can all be linked to our collective behavior. It's time to take uh, schools of public health with leadership such as this here at Harvard School of Public Health, come together collectively and bring about uh, a shift in well-being. And I'll just end there. Well-being is more than wellness. Wellness is having a good cholesterol level and good blood pressure. But well-being is a state of consciousness where you measure the quality of your life in all the different buckets that I mentioned, physical, emotional, spiritual, community, social, financial, and career. Thank you. It's great to be here. I welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Carol Hills, and um, I wanted to unpack a lot of what uh, doc Dr. Chopra is talking about in his new book and, and in his remarks. Um, I think most of us in this room um, are familiar with uh, wellness and mindfulness, and there's a whole genre of uh, books and uh, films and documentaries. And, um, it's in many ways it's focused on the individual and what individuals can do to take responsibility for their own health. And I wonder how do we, um, I want to frame this conversation by thinking about how do we apply these things in the world of public health? And um, where we're talking about populations and we're talking very often about populations without access, uh, living in poverty. Uh, people whose lives are full of stress and have very uh, little to, to work with. And so I wanted to start with, um, you mentioned one thing in your opening remarks about blockchain technology, and I wonder if you could uh, elaborate on that, uh, where, where it concerns public health. Well, blo blockchain technologies are self-regulating uh, movements and technologies for just about everything. So one can create blockchain technology. In fact, I'm in the process of doing that, and I was talking to Dean Williams about it, that you could create a social movement where you have reward systems for well-being and social engagement and service. And those reward systems could be recognition uh, from, say, the Harvard School of Public Health, or opportunities to serve or get a job in the area of well-being. And I think it takes well-being and democratizes it, whether it's through blockchain technologies or cryptocurrencies that can be used as reward systems. Give, give an example. So we create a well-being community in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and everybody here is part of it. And uh, it, uh, it, they have access to it through a private uh, code and they share ideas and they share um, goals, whether it's optimizing nutrition, weight loss, better sleep, service to the community, spiritual practice. In exchange, they get um, um, money for it, a cryptocurrency that can be used only for improving well-being and service. Are there examples or models for that approach um, 
in other countries it's or among populations? It's a very new model, and uh, it's moving very fast, uh, especially among the millennials. Millennials, I see a future even for democracy uh, in the future globally, whereas global citizens and global citizen scientists, we can contribute both our services and also get uh, back advice and participate even in the electoral process by voting on values uh, rather than on personalities. And do you see this translating among populations that uh, live in poverty? Are there ways to introduce this kind of thing uh, among the populations that right people Right now, it's, it's not health? in that demographic right now, but it, it could be, especially in places like India where everybody has a mobile phone. So it could be uh, part of that. But as far as um, uh, managing stress in impoverished areas, uh, as Dr. Dean Williams knows, we have a program in uh, New York uh, in the very impoverished areas. It's called the Urban Yogis, where uh, regular practices such as those I mentioned are bringing the uh, community violence and murder rate down just by doing this. Now, that could be incorporated ultimately through a blockchain technology as well. But I think for impoverished areas, especially in school systems, it's very easy to introduce some of these ideas. And uh, meditation doesn't have to be a complicated process, or mindfulness doesn't have to be a complicated process. It's just getting in touch with your inner self. In fact, we could try an experiment right now, which will take five seconds. Are you game for it? Are you game for it? So everyone who's watching us, uh, I'm going to ask you a question, and the answer is yes. I'm giving you the answer uh, before I ask you the question. OK? So please say yes after I ask you the question. Are you aware right now? Yes. Can you be a little more enthusiastic? <laughs> Are you aware right now? Yes. OK. Now I'm going to ask you the same question, but before don't answer it till I lift my hand up, OK? So same question, and then you can say yes when I lift my hand up. Are you aware? Yes. So are you aware is a thought. The answer yes is a thought. In between is you as awareness. People are so overshadowed by their thoughts and perceptions and experiences in the external world that they never get in touch with themselves. So now I'm going to ask you the same question. Are you aware? And this time, just be aware of that which is listening. Are you aware? This presence is who you really are, not your thoughts, which recycle in social media, but the presence in which experience occurs. You can stop any time and ask yourself, am I aware? shouldn't be a complicated process. I want to remind people that we're going to have a Q&A uh, from online uh, viewers and, and all of you here uh, in the form of emails. If you want to email questions, uh, you can email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu, or you can post them on Facebook at Harvard Public Health, or post them on the live chat at the forum site. Um, in, in, in terms of introducing questions, I wanted to, uh, we have some questions in advance from people who've written in prior to this event. And um, this was from Jasmine Hall. And she asks, in some ways, what I'm trying to get at, what, what practical steps can we take to promote well-being to communities that do not always have basic needs met, uh, to be more inclusive of socioeconomic status and less privileged populations? Yes, I think that's the major challenge we have, as uh, both in academia and outside of academia. I think it is to create partnerships, to create social networks, to engage people through social media, but focus on those three things that I mentioned. Volunteering, community service as part of the volunteering, gathering together to discuss issues for the communities or what are challenges, having a vision for the future, and a spiritual or mindful 
awareness or awarefulness practice, <laughs> if I can call it that. But um, these movements are happening right now because people are fed up of waiting for the government, of waiting for even institutions to take action. And when we discuss well-being in most places outside of schools of public health, it's about insurance. It's not about well-being. Health reform is not about health reform. It's about health insurance. But health insurance is, is very critical. It's of critical, and, and I would and argue we are one country where it is unavailable. Right, and a, particularly in a, in a country like the U.S. and. Uh, it's, it is actually a source of, of deep stress. A deep stress, if, and if, if you, you know, don't I mean, have I spent my childhood in a developing country, and we never had to think about it. We never had to think about education, or health, or well-being because it was taken care of by the public sector. Yes, for for some Indians, but yes. probably there's millions yeah. of other Indians who didn't. Yeah, have but in India has a huge volunteer right. force as well, and more NGOs than the United States. I want to talk about stress. It's a big topic in your book, uh, and it's a real concern uh, for people in the field of, of global health and a, and a concern of Dean Williams and, and the School of Public Health here. Um, you talk about ways to reduce stress, getting out of overdrive, connecting with nature, making time for yourself, confiding in a friend. And, and you talk, as, as you did in your opening remarks, about how lifelong stress can, can or managing lifelong stress can really reduce the incidence of um, chronic disease. But how do we, are, are, are the examples either in the United States or overseas of, of places where it's again outside of the realm of the individual uh, who's, who's, who's learning and taking responsibility? Are there, are there healthcare systems that are addressing stress and reducing stress as a primary concern that maybe the US could look to? There are no healthcare systems officially in the world that are looking at stress, which is the number one epidemic of our civilization, which is directly or indirectly connected to almost every chronic illness, even risk for acute illness. So there are no programs, but there are many volunteer organizations. I mentioned one because I'm close to it, the Urban Yogis in Queens in New York, They've done a remarkable job, not only of improving their well-being in a very impoverished African-American community, but they've become leaders in their field. They're now teaching this to other people, and the crime rate is coming down. There's a direct correlation between social violence and individual stress as well. But crime rates are coming down for a lot of other reasons, as too. Say that again? Crime rates are coming down for a lot of other reasons, too. In this rates. particular demographic no. we are looking at, we are attributing it to the self-organization of the community itself in this particular community. One thing I wanted to ask is, it seems like, um, you know, in the 60s and 70s and as various parts of certainly American history, uh, there were group political movements, and it was the group uh, that was moving toward political ends and political ideals. And, you know, for the past 20 or 30 years, it's really been about kind of self-realization, um, taking charge of oneself, whether it's working out, whether it's fitness, whether it's mindfulness. And is there a role for politics and uh, sort of group behavior in trying to achieve these things since they are so critical for the health of individuals uh, for their entire life? So I started my career in Boston in the early 70s, and there was busing. There were racial riots in Boston. Yeah, you probably remember them too. Um, there were a lot of issues right then that were emerging. Feminism, Gloria Steinem was marching the streets of Cambridge. There was the peace movement. There was the green movement. And, you know, in my naivete, I was 24 years old. I thought we were, going, we were going to change the world in the next 10 years. And look where we've gone now. We've regressed by 60 years, I would say. So we are right now not in a position where we can say that this is the ideal situation for a society, or a community, or a nation, or the world. And we need to revive uh, that kind of zeitgeist, where um, politics ultimately will be influenced by social opinion, by public opinion, as it is always. You see right now, 
what is happening in the political uh, world, it's being influenced by social opinion. And I think in order for well-being to be part of the political arena, it's young people who should now be both voting and getting involved in the issues we are talking about. I'm going to introduce another question uh, from someone who sent it in, in advance, Archana Basu. Uh, she, she asks, uh, how can current systems of health in the U.S. move to a more preventative model of care? I think current systems in the U.S. have to listen to what is happening in schools of public health. Schools of public health need to get better funding, which is not happening at the moment, by the way, even though everyone's aware that public health is the number one issue. Uh, both for prevention and for prediction of what happens in a society, the funding is not happening. So we need a political movement in that direction that can only come from the public. And I think we have an advantage in the fact that we can use social media as well to bring these ideas um, to everybody's attention. The internet, if you look at it, it's the global brain right now. And it's a very active global brain. You can send somebody a tweet in South Africa and you can give them a dopamine hit or you can, <laughs> or you can be abusive on the internet and raise their blood pressure. So we are all connected. We are inseparably woven into the fabric of being and living. We are monitoring each other's brains. We are being monitored by each other. And we are regulating each other and being regulated by each other. There is no such thing as a separate self. So even self-realization and all these movements that started with, you know, it's all about me, ultimately leads to we. It, the me leads to we, but it also leads to a lot of stress. I mean, digital, the digital age is, is, is Online life is, is also yeah, a big distraction. And so how do we kind of counter that? Um, I, I, you know, people are really never away One from work One is now. technology is not going to go away. OK, so uh, if you don't like what's happening in uh, the world of technology and, uh, and in social media, and you don't adapt, then Darwinian principles say <laughs> that you will become <laughs> irrelevant. <laughs> so you cannot stop the technology movement. How do we use it? Right now, it's being used by trolls <laughs> and by gangsters posing as political leaders globally. Uh, we need to get involved in using social media so we can actually bring awareness uh, about these issues, violence, social justice, economic justice, peace, conflict resolution, climate change. This is the best use of social media. And I use social media very prolifically, but I have times when I use it. So I have media time, exercise time, meditation time, uh, and work time. And I do one thing at a time, because multitasking, your brain can't do it. It's a myth. Your, your cortical brain cannot multitask. Only your reptilian brain, which is taking care of your autonomic nervous system, it's already multitasking anyway without your help. But your conscious choices have to be made mindfully. And if you're multitasking, if you're looking at your phone and speaking to me at the same time, you're doing neither. Okay, so it's a myth. And it's the one thing that actually ruins your neural networks, you know, because they get confused if you try to do too many things all at the same time. That's the bane of media and being seduced by it. Technology is neutral. Are you going to use it for destructive purposes? Or can you help create a better world? I think you and I and many people in this room, we have, we have the luxury, uh, if, if we're willing, to, to compartmentalize and create separate spaces for our life. But again, putting it into a public health context, are there uh, other examples or models where these kinds of things are really being taken seriously, even in a very micro level. In, um, in the United States, everything becomes political. So if you want to introduce something to a school system, it becomes political. So it's a huge problem. Um, but the best use 
of knowledge is education. And uh, education is easily accomplished in schools. And education for well-being should be the most important aspect of education. The word education or education, the word comes from educor, which means to bring out what's already at the core of a child or a human being, which is infinite creativity. And we're not doing it. We're giving them information overload, which right now, who needs that with the internet? You know, you can look up anything. So it has to be public health and education have to go together. In many parts of the world, education is free. And are there any parts of the world where that kind of uh, thinking is going to on? To some extent. In India, it is happening. To some extent, it's happening in urban uh, societies in New York and other uh, cities, but not, not mm -hmm. enough. We have another question we received in advance from uh, Marie Andre Lopez Gomez. She asked, what is the role of work in well-being and how is the work culture in the US affecting well-being? And, and she adds, are there any examples of work cultures around the world that offer examples? Well, here's the unfortunately depressing data. <laughs> only 50 only 20% of people in the United States are fully engaged in their work, which means they enjoy going to work. They enjoy working with the people at work. They are complementing and being complemented in their strengths. They have shared vision, and they're emotionally connected. Only 20%. 80% um, of people in the American workforce are either disengaged or actively disengaged. So disengaged means you just go because it's a job you have to do. Actively disengaged means that you, you're unhappy and you go to work to make other people unhappy. Okay? <laughs> this costs uh, the United States about $300 billion a year, um, job disengagement. Unfortunately, this is true all over the world, by the way. Um, there are some countries where it, they're ahead of the United States. So if you look at overall well-being, in the buckets I mentioned, work well-being, social well-being, community well-being, the United States is about 14 in what, the world. What are the countries that are, seem to be doing a bit better? Denmark, Canada, even uh, Panama. Panama? Uh, Panama. What are they doing there? Uh, well, I think it's a burgeoning economy right now, and so they're doing very well right now. But there are other countries, Costa Rica, uh, other Scandinavian countries, of course, if you bring up the Scandinavian yeah. model in this They're country, always doing everything right. It becomes, uh, <laughs> it yeah. becomes a political <laughs> issue again. Um, I wonder, y y your, your book, uh, The Healing Self, um, which I read, and I'm actually taking some steps and trying to reduce the clutter in my own mind, uh, but um, your book, this one and others, they put a lot of responsibility on individuals to take charge of their health care, to be an informed, uh, inquisitive patient. You have lists, checklists, things people can do. Um, in the public health sector, um, is there, should we be thinking about it differently? Is, is the individual approach and the burden of the individual to make things, things happen and take charge, is that the right approach in the public health setting? Not completely. Of, of course, there cannot be social well-being in the absence of personal well-being. That's a given. But when you have social engagement around anything, whether it's losing weight or providing a service or um, exercise or mindfulness practices, then the more socially engaged you can get and the more you can do participation as, as in a group, the more likely you are to be um, successful. Now, having said that, I've created something which uh, uh, I call the Internet of Wellbeing, where I bring together experts in all these areas we mentioned, uh, including conflict resolution, personal relationship management. It's free, and you get people to participate, create their own groups and ultimately create a blockchain movement, which we haven't done, but we're in the process, so that there's a system where people are rewarded, even for little nudges, you know, standing up every hour, 
or making uh, sure that you get 10,000 steps uh, a day or getting sleep. If we can participate as a group and create a reward system, it works. I wonder, um, you, you've had a long and, and storied career and you've become your own brand, really. You know, you're, you're this huge figure in the wellness movement. And, and there's other people, you know, uh, Andrew Weil and Dr. Oz, there's lots of people out there. And do you ever feel like there's something paradoxical about that, of being sort of a brand name in this field of wellness and mindfulness? <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, fortunately, I have a wife and kids who don't take me seriously. <laughs> So that helps a lot. Um, secondly, I've learned over the years not to believe in my public uh, persona because for everything that's said about you that's good, somebody saying something about you that's the extreme opposite. So as you grow older, you learn to handle it uh, in a better way. And it wasn't planned. You know, I, I was planning to be an internist and... Uh, right here in Boston. Right here in Boston, and that's what I did. But then, you know, I couldn't help notice that I had two patients who had the same illness, received the same treatment, saw the same doctor, and had completely different outcomes. This person died, this person recovered completely. So I knew there was something missing in our mechanistic approach to our well-being or even looking at our biological organism. We were looking at our biological organism as a physical machine, and it's not. You know, you can interfere with mechanisms of disease, but you, if you don't address the origins of disease, no amount of mechanistic in, uh, interference is going to help. So it was my journey which was accidental. Neuroscience, endocrinology, neuropeptides, mind-body medicine, integrative well-being, and now trying to figure out what is it all about. We're going to turn to Q&A in about a minute uh, from online questions. But my last question to you is, what is the research that either you're involved in or other people are involved in that you're most excited about in the field of wellness? The most exciting research is what I mentioned, um, epigenetics, where you can see how your genes are activated through every experience, whether it's a perceptual experience or a mental experience. So epigenetics, the microbiome, looking at the two million genes that you have, um, you have only 25,000 human genes, but you have two million uh, bacterial genes that respond to every experience, but particularly to nutrition. So for me, that's very exciting. And the third is how we can change and amplify the coordination between the reptilian, emotional, and intellectual brain, which is my work with uh, Rudy Tanzi here at Harvard. You know, now that he and I have worked so many years together, actually we're so aware of what's happening in our brain, even in a conversation like this, I know which part of my brain I'm looking at right now. We're, we're gonna move to um, questions that have come in online. Um, and the first one is from Emmanuel, and uh, she asks, what is the single most threatening problem facing a child's health and security today and in the near future? And how can we as parents and as society equip our children to avoid this problem? What, what can we do today to change the course of their future? Well, unfortunately, again, uh, childhood uh, trauma and childhood uh, abuse, whether it's sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, all leads to problems in adulthood. It sets also something called the brain set point for happiness or unhappiness. If a child is given what I call the four A's, attention, deep listening, affection, deep caring and love, appreciation, noticing the child's strengths, and acceptance, not trying to conform their behavior to how you think they should be, acceptance, and looking at their strengths, that child will grow up to be a healthy adult. And if a child is in some way um, abused or ignored, ignored is even worse than, by the way, being criticized, 
because ignored means you don't exist, and then that child will go become a dysfunctional adult emotionally, it may end up winning a political uh, election though. Here's a, here's, a, here's, a, here's a question from We Amin. That's the name that's given. Um, how do you believe societal taboos or norms contribute to health improvement and how do they hinder health improvement? Well, when societal taboos and norms become, become purveyors of um, uh, self-righteous morality, then they interfere with um, creativity and, um, and um, authentic uh, behavior. In, you know, imposed morality never works. So that's where societal mores and norms and religious uh, institutions can cause problem and even abuse. But many religious institutions and societal institutions actually do a lot for the world. You know, the, some of the biggest humanitarian movements in the world are actually religious movements. So we should give them credit for the good that they do and the service they provide. They are the people who are working in these impoverished areas. And also, your, your own background and the Ayurvedic traditions in many ways come from uh, particular Indian cultures and traditions. Yeah, it's very so strongly it's influenced in. by the wisdom traditions of India, yes. Um, here's a question from Raphael. He asks, what are your thoughts about cultural appropriation in reference to Western medicine starting to adopt ideas of mindfulness, meditation, and alternative medicine? I think it's a great thing if it helps the world. Uh, we are, I look at the future when I'm not around where nationalism or extreme nationalism will be considered a tribal disease. Um, that we, as we move into the future, especially with the next generation and the next generation, we'll be global citizens and uh, we will adapt to other cultures. I have a grandson right now who's uh, a little bit Chinese, a little bit Indian, and of course he lives in America. He speaks Spanish, Hindi, English, and Mandarin at the same time. <laughs> That's the future citizen of the world. He's a fully realized self. <laughs> that, 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 that is the future of the world. And so I think um, we need to go beyond our tribal behavior, and I think extreme nationalism is just tribalism. So it's not going, and cultural appropriation, cultures get richer when they mix with each other. So I'm not one for total cultural identity. Culture can be a baggage. It can also be access to good food and to good music. <laughs> but other than that, I think we need a multicultural society in a multicultural world. And America is the best example of that so far, unless we go the other way now with our immigration policies. Here's a question from Fatma. In your role as a physician and spiritual guru, could you please elaborate on the interaction between mental state and physical health? You can't separate mental state and physical health. Wherever the mind goes, the molecules follow. Uh, in fact, they're inseparable. So this distinction between mind, mental state, and physical state is artificial. Uh, I can give you bad news and your blood pressure will go up in a moment if it affects you, that bad news. On the other hand, uh, if you're feeling appreciated, wanted, and loved, you'll have a different biochemistry. Your state of mind even influences the way your food is metabolized. So because, you know, the different chemistries in the body uh, when you're stressed or when you're relaxed or when you're celebrating, completely different. So there's no distinction between mind and body. There, we should use one word, body-mind, just the way we use wave particle, mass energy, space-time, body-mind. Here's a question from Deborah J. As a, as a public health professional, what actionable steps can we take to encourage better holistic and self-care for our patients? I think every physician 
in the field should be an educator as well. So when I was in practice in Boston, uh, I used to give my patients a choice. I would tell them, I'm happy to give you a tranquilizer, a sleeping pill, in those days, an antacid. We didn't have these sophisticated H2 receptor blockers or proton uh, pump inhibitors. But you know, I realized very quickly that 90% of all prescriptions were for five things, pain, anxiety, nausea, insomnia, and constipation. If you want to remember the acronym, it's PANIC. <laughs> P-A-N-I-C. I used to watch my nurses waking up patients to give them sleeping pills. Mr. Smith, will you please wake up? I have to give you your sleeping pill. OK, so all these things are very easily manageable. So I would tell my patients, I'd give you a prescription if you want. But on Friday, I'm going to give a lecture on well-being. Sure. And soon I noticed that more people were showing up for the lecture than for the prescription. And you know, you can even, to physicians out there in public health, you can even charge for it. You know, charge a little bit for your lectures. They'll be valued. Um, but uh, make sure they're less than a prescription in price. Here's a question from Adele. What research topics would Dr. Chopra recommend for young scholars to analyze in the interface between well-being and spirituality? And spirituality. Look up a paper called Non-Duality and Well-Being. Non-Duality and Well-Being. It's about the relationship of spirituality and well-being. And basically, it means that the more, you know, what is spirituality? It's just the question I asked you. Are you aware? The more self-aware you are, that's spirituality. Don't mix it up with religion. The more aware you are of your inner self, and the more aware you are of your mental activity and your perceptual activity, and the more aware you are of your choices, that improves your well-being. So spirituality is being self-aware, period. Here's a question. It's a long question, but you have to give a short answer because okay. we're running out of time. Really? Here it is. Time doesn't exist. <laughs> it's a human construct. No other animal knows what time it is now. Um, this, is from, this is from Ida, and it's kind of a serious question. Given the ever-increasing language of hate, exclusion, and violence, and its impact on the many who find themselves at the receiving end, how can we limit the assault uh, and or help improve wellness caused by this kind of stress? Yeah, by the way, it, it, it's only obvious when you look at the internet because the dominant activity is that of trolls. But by and large, people are actually out there to help each other, to engage with each other, and understand that relationship is who we are. There's no such thing as a separate self. And that's a very positive note to end this on. Our event, unfortunately, has come to an end. It's been a fascinating discussion. I want to thank our audience, uh, both here and online, for joining us. And uh, thank you to Deepak Chopra and Dean Michelle Williams. You can continue the conversation at forumhsph.org and look for the on-demand video there on Facebook, and on Facebook and YouTube. And join, and join the forum next time on September 26 at noon Eastern time for a live web, webcast about US drug prices. Why are they so high? Thank you so much.